Today we're going to spend about 45 minutes walking through the basics of a resume. Can someone tell me why you need a resume? What's the purpose? Don't be shy. To show your accomplishments? Okay, what else? When someone says, I want to see your resume, or I need to write a resume, yes? Okay, so for, you said employer, so a job application, right? You're applying for a job. What else do you need a resume for? Yeah? Um, to show who you are professionally for any given um, thing you might be applying to, whether it be schools or a job. Great, yeah, exactly. So what I appreciate that none of you said is, why do I need a resume to get a job? Because at the end of the day, a resume will never get you a job. It's not about you submitting this piece of paper and suddenly being given a job. It's all about an opportunity. It's all about a conversation. It's a discussion. So it's a discussion about who you are. It's a one-page story of your life. And it's, it's very important real estate. So you need to really consider that when you're writing a resume, it may take you more time to write than a 10-page paper. Because every single word that goes on that page is important and should describe you in some way. So as we get started, I don't want you to ever think that a resume is about getting a job. It's not. It's your, it's your story, it's your life, and it it's really should be representative of who you are and who you've been over the past several years. If you're a college student, you're going to focus on the time you've been in college and maybe the tail end of high school. If you're an alum who's been out of college for 10 years, it's going to explain what you've done with those 10 years since graduating from college. So again, it's really about highlighting the things that you've done if you're a younger student, if you're a freshman or a sophomore, a resume is a great reminder of the things you want to do. So as we go through, as I show you some of these samples, I want you to think about what, what does my story say about me? What am I putting on my resume? And if there's not something, if there's a space, if there's a lack of a story, a lack of a dialogue, what do you need to do to get information to put on that page? What experiences do you need? What skills do you need? What, what do you want to go out and gain? Certifications, volunteerism, leadership positions. So as we go through this, I want you to constantly think, this isn't about getting a job. This isn't about a graduate school application. This is about telling my story to someone who's asking to see it. That might be for a recommendation. It might be for a professor, because surprisingly enough, they don't know what you do outside of their class. So if they're writing you a recommendation, consider using your resume for that as well. So there's, there's many, many uses that you're going to use, hopefully. So we've, we've established that a resume is important. Regardless of major, you need a resume. We had a healthcare luncheon two weeks ago, and the professor that came from the medical school at Wake Forest said, my favorite thing you said was come see me about writing your resume. Because so often biology majors will say, I don't need a resume. I, I'm going to medical school, I'm applying, I don't need a resume. Everyone needs a resume because again, you may need to illustrate what your story is. So it's very important. We're gonna talk about today how to create one and then once you have one, nail what? Kind of what are the next steps? And that's when we'll move into cover letter writing and discussing networking and how to, use, how to write a networking email. Now this is very casual and informal, so if you've got questions as I go, I want you to stop me and ask. But do understand that your resume is as individual as you. So none of you look the same sitting in this room. I don't expect your resumes to look the same. I'm going to give you a sample. I'm going to throw some examples up on the board. We'll talk about them. But at the end of the day, this has to be your story. So you have to feel comfortable with what you're displaying on that page. First and foremost, profile statements. A lot of people will come to me and say, oh, I need to write an objective statement. How many of you have heard of an objective statement? A few of you, exactly. An objective is no longer something that employers or 
anyone for that matter, really needs to see on your resume. In the past, it was, I am seeking an entry level position in the financial industry. With the crash back in 2008 of our global economy, employers we're given the opportunity to be a lot more picky. So suddenly, they're not really interested in what your objective is. They're more interested in you telling them right up front what it is you bring to the table. What are your strengths? So again, this is like the introductory chapter to that story of your life. It, it should serve basically as a foundation for the rest of your resume. So nothing that you say there in your profile statement should um, be a lie or not be represented somewhere else in your resume. So be very careful. When I say things like experience in, they need to be able to find that experience. If I say academically successful, I need my GPA should reflect that. So everything you say here is very important. Now some basics. Three to five single space lines written in, fr in phrases. So there's no full sentences here. Any of you English majors, of which I was one, throw out the idea of using proper grammar because you're going to go straight into verbs, um, action, really driving home what you've done and what your experiences are, what you're bringing to the table. So here's our first sample. Recent graduate of Wofford College with a Bachelor of Arts in Economics. So this has given me an idea about their academic standing. Strong academic background coupled with practical experience in the fields of finance and real estate development. A team player with an exceptional ability to both lead and follow. Strengths include presentation, marketing, and relationship building. Flexible individual with the ability to learn quickly and adapt to any environment. What are some things after reading this that you can tell me about this individual? What do you see in this statement? They've been outside the classroom. They've been outside the, exactly. Practical experience in the fields of finance and real estate. This individual had had two internships, one in finance and one in real estate. What else can you tell me? Very, very flexible. So maybe they've had some leadership positions that, that illustrate their flexibility. How about this strong academic background? What do you think their GPA is when they say something like strong? Over a 3.5, yeah. If you're over a 3.0, I consider you consistently academic performer. performer. Um, strong needs to be, I, I've hit the dean's list a couple times. If you say something like exceptional academic performance, you need to be flirting with a 4.0 or a 385 to, uh, and above. So again, every word matters on this. What about a team player with an exceptional ability to both lead and follow? What would that make you think of? Who can confidently say they're a team player? A student athlete. I mean, automatically. Now, I'm not saying if you're not a student athlete, you can't call yourself a team player. But you, when you are a student athlete, you can say that with confidence because you're illustrating somewhere else on your resume that you have committed time to being on a team. So again, be very careful about what you list and know that they're reading into that. Highly motivated finance and German major with a solid track of consistent academic performance, so a slightly different GPA here. Excellent communication skills combined with a highly analytical approach to problem solving to create an extremely balanced contributor. Focused self-starter who understands winning requires strong teamwork and dedication to the task at hand. Honor Society double major who anticipates a BA in finance and German from Wofford in May 2010, fluent in German. What are some things you learn about this person? What kind of job do you think this person might be looking for? Finance and German major. International, International business. What are some companies in our area that this person might be targeting? BMW, exactly. So really highlighting that finance and German major. They're telling them right off, I am fluent in German. You should be interested in me. So they're highlighting one of those skills. 
So this is a profile statement. Now again, this might not be a fit for your resume. You may decide, I don't really, I don't agree with using that. That's not really helpful for me. I don't want to put that at the beginning of my resume. So if you don't, you don't. It's a, it's a decision that you make. It does help recruiters because sometimes they'll slow down long enough to read that first paragraph. And then it preps them for who you are. Occasionally I've had recruiters tell me I don't read that. I skip straight to the experience. So it's a decision you need to make about whether or not your resume needs that. Next, get the reader's attention. Make sure that you're giving room and space for your honors. Now, when I say highlight your honors, your, your dean's list, the scholarships, do not do that in exhaustive detail. Be very careful. You want to give them enough information to intrigue them. They want to bring you in, interview you, discuss those things, but walk a line there. When do you receive your scholarships often? Freshman year. When are you applying for jobs? When are you showing people your resume? Senior year normally or later. So there's a four year gap between I got this award and now I'm, I'm, I'm displaying this as an honor. So again, things that are more, more useful on a resume might be the fact that you were inducted into the Blue Key Honor Society or Phi Beta Kappa or one of your um, subject, your major honor society. So again, be careful, don't use up too much of your space going on and on about scholarships you received four years before. So you want to highlight these things, but you want to do it carefully. Also, leadership positions. I can't tell you how many students come in my office and say, I have nothing to put on a resume. And after 20 minutes, I discover that they've led their fraternity or their sorority. They're in APO. They've held several positions in their um, major oriented organizations. And they've had the opportunity to do a lot of great things outside the classroom. Highlight those leadership experiences. Now, they should not be considered experience in the sense of a job or an internship, but they are extremely important and they belong on your resume. And don't just list jobs. I want you to explain to me what you did in that internship. If you were a runner for a law firm, tell me if you were responsible for delivering confidential documents. Were you allowed to go and observe in the courtroom? If you worked in an office and mostly what you did was focusing on doing administrative tasks, that's fine, but tell me about the time you got responsibility. Um, always focus on facts and figures. So any time that you can tell me something specific, how many of you have managed a budget of some sort? Several of you. Tell me how much that budget is. We have several students on campus that manage upwards of $75,000, $80,000 budgets. So you need to list that. Or even if it's a small budget, were you in charge of allocating funds, making sure things were paid for? So again, try to highlight your facts and your figures. So how many people were you in charge of? Did you raise money? How many volunteers attended? If you were doing an internship, how many projects were you assigned and what did those look like? Don't focus on old experience. In college, I have a four-year rule, so if you are a senior, you really should not host any high school information on your resume. There are a couple things you may still want to include if you are an Eagle Scout. That's something that kind of transcends high school, so you would include that. There, there might be a few other things that we could discuss, but for the most part, if you're a freshman, there's still going to be a lot of high school stuff on your resume. Um, junior year, you may have some things from your, your senior year in high school, but by the time you're at the end of college, you really want to have only recent things that you've done while you've been in college. Now, once you leave college, you begin building your employment history. So you should have everything that you've done since college for the most part. I've heard it said as well that 10 years back is enough to go and then past that you can answer questions about it. So there's a lot of different takes on how far back to go once you're out of college. One thing I will say, education should stay at the top of your resume until you've done more time outside of the classroom than you've done inside the classroom. So. If I graduate and get a job immediately after college, how long before I put experience before education? If it took me the normal amount of time to graduate from Wofford. This is so not hard. Four years. 
All right, four years. So after I've worked in the workforce for four years. Now, what does that mean for someone that goes on to graduate school? Education stays at the top a little bit longer. So if I go to law school, it's going to be years before I move that down and put my experience up there. Does that make sense? And that's why if you look at a professor's CV, what they call a resume, a professor's resume will almost always have their doctorate work at the top of their resume because they've been in school for 10 to 12 years. So it takes them quite a while before the experience outpaces their education. Okay? Tailor your resume to your reader. There's no perfect one resume. You will have a base resume, but if you were a biology and English major like me, you might have an English resume that is more highlighting the internships and the experiences I had that were for my English degree. And then I might have a scientific resume that highlights the fact that I was a teaching assistant in several of the biology labs, that I had done an internship in research, and I might highlight those things differently. I may even change my bullets and highlight different activities I did based on what jobs I'm applying for, what graduate school I'm applying for, or even what professor I'm sending that resume to. Um, and make sure you highlight skills they need. If you're applying for a job and it says that you have to have experience in Microsoft Office, it would be a good idea to review that resume and make sure that at some point you're highlighting that you have those skills. Limit certain information. You want to make sure that your age, marital status, religious or political affiliations aren't listed. You do not have to include that information. If you're applying for jobs internationally, that might be different. In the United States, we're not allowed to expect that type of information. It's actually illegal. But if you are working in Germany, they do have the right to ask you certain things. They can ask you your home origin, for example. Also, be aware that your associations and your activities can reveal certain things about you. What's one example of an activity that might say something about me? College Republicans. I'm the president of College Republicans. That's going to clearly indicate that more than likely I vote Republican. What else? What are some other associations that might... religious affiliation, so if I put that I was a part of the Presbyterian Student Association, people might see that and think certain things. So I don't want you to think you should not highlight that information, but I do want you to understand what you're opening yourself up to as you list those things. So just be aware. We had a student several years ago who had um, three different resumes. He helped start um, one of our organizations on campus that really geared itself towards tolerance and you know same-sex relationships and it's called Spectrum and it, it's a great, it's a phenomenal organization but he found after he was applying for jobs and specifically he was applying for jobs in Mississippi he found that he wasn't getting any interviews and we had, we had a very serious discussion about whether or not he should include that on his resume and he took it off and immediately started getting job interviews. Now is that right? Is our world right because of that? No. No, I do not agree with that, but you need to understand that you're opening yourself up to that type of discrimination when you do it. So even though it's not fair and it's not right, and he actually went on to get a great position in Mississippi and is doing great things there, and has even brought his talents that he gained in those organizations to the company he's working for now, he realized that it was getting his foot in the door and that he's been able to change things, but he wouldn't have had that opportunity had he not taken it off his resume. So just be aware of that. Use clean formatting. No curly cues, no pink scented paper, no colorful fonts. You really want to stick with the basics and make sure that you're using fonts like Calibri, um, Cambria, Times, Times New Roman. Hmm. And stick with basic formats for your document as well. 
a lot of times people will say, well, I opened up a template and I started inputting information. A template will give you boxes, and the problem with that is none of you are, are made to fit in a box. And so I always open a blank Word document and start from there. So you'll use bold and all caps to highlight things. You can even do italics. You can also insert lines to kind of break up the different sections of your resume, but really stick with a very basic format. So go in and open up your document and see, is it double spacing things? Because I have to keep it to a page, so I need to make sure it's not doing any double spacing and never go smaller than 11 point font. A lot of people will say, if I'm going to keep it to a single page, I want to go smaller, I want to go to 10. Suddenly, people can't read your resume. They have to pull out the magnifying glass. So you want to make sure that you're doing, doing your resume in a format that's readable. Resume scanning is common. What this means is once you get your resume done and you do start to use it for applications, there is a software program that will process everything that's on your page and only pull out keywords. So again, going back to reading job descriptions and graduate school applications, make sure that you know that the keywords highlighted in that job description are somewhere in your resume. Because if they're not, more than likely when they scan that resume, it's going to get tossed out. When you get ready to send your resume, make sure that you've saved it as a PDF. Now, if you're sending it to someone to read and proof, send it as a document so that they can change things. But once you're ready to send it out, save it as a PDF. This prevents any formats from changing and make sure that the person reading your resume is reading the same thing that you sent out. It looks the same. Because often people will send me a document and I open it in a different version of Word and suddenly your resume is two pages or the margins changed or the fonts changed. So make sure you always save it as a PDF. Excuse my cold. Order. So these are the headings that you'll want to make sure that you have on your resume. Contact information is first. This would be your name, normally written larger and bold, as well as your hometown and state, your email, and your cell phone number. Mistakes to avoid with contact information. Do not give two email addresses. You will confuse the recruiter or the person that you're sending your resume to. They need to have a single place that they respond to you at. Do not give two phone numbers. Use your cell phone number. Make sure you have a very professional voicemail greeting so that they can leave you a message and you can call them back. Also, I say hometown and state. Don't include your full address. We're not at a point any longer where they're going to be mailing you anything. And you also will fill out an employment application if they do need your physical address. Yes? If you're going to graduate school, do you need to put the hometown state by never email address since they have that now? It's up to you. Normally for formatting, you still want your resume to look like a resume, so I would include all that information. It doesn't take up that much space. Another question towards the back, no? Okay. The next would be your profile statement, followed by education. So your education is going to include Wofford College. If you're younger than a senior, you may include your high school. Also, tell me where Wofford College is. Not everyone knows. So you want to make sure you tell them that it's in Spartanburg, South Carolina, the dates you attended, and you may also include your courses there. This would be followed by experience, and experience includes any part-time job that you've held on campus or off, any full-time job that you've held, any internship, or any shadowing. So this is anything that you've been paid to do or that relates directly to your job. There's really nothing on campus as far as activities save one thing that, in my opinion, counts as experience. If you're on the James Fund, that does count as experience, and I'll tell you why. It is a student-managed investment fund, but they are putting their hands in real money every day, lots of real money. So that one does count as experience, whereas most of your leadership positions would fall under activities. Skills. A lot of people will say, why do I need to list skills? These would be computer skills, certifications like CPR, first aid, EMT, real estate license. Some of you get those over the summer. 
Um, computer skills would be anything in the Adobe suite that you can do. If you're a computer science major, you have a lot of computer skills, so you'll list those. It's, it's not really helpful to list that you understand the internet. <laughs> Instead, you may want to focus on Microsoft Office, if you can use Photoshop. Also, social media, sometimes you can highlight that if you've done it for a group, but just your own personal social media doesn't actually qualify you as experienced in social media. Certifications, lab techniques, so if you're a science major, you would list if you can do DNA electrophoresis, if you know how to do titrations, if you've learned how to do certain types of biological processes, you would list some of those. And then finally, if you have any non-technical skills, if you're able to play an instrument or you have a language, languages would be another section as well. And finally, your activities. Now, activities headings can be broken into different categories. You may have a leadership heading. You may have an athletics heading. You may have a community involvement heading for those things that you've done off campus. So again, activities may simply be activities, but you may break it down into a little bit more specific information. Keep it brief. Again, write in phrases. You're going to want to stick to one page. Don't go longer than a page. And don't mis misrepresent your past. We actually had a faculty member apply for a position, not one of our faculty members, a candidate apply for a position that we had available on campus. And there were some questions about her, her resume. And one of the faculty members on the search committee began to make phone calls. And it turned out that everything on her resume was a lie. And she had not actually done any of the presentations and the publications she had discussed. So a lot of times it doesn't even take an official background check for those things to fall apart. And they, they do happen. I get calls constantly about students and when they're doing a background check. So just be very careful about what you're listing on there. Be honest. You don't want to, um, you don't want to misrepresent yourself. Also, uh, check your Facebook and LinkedIn and make sure that if someone's searching you, are those online profiles representing who you are as well. Finally, spell check does not equal proofreading. These are a couple samples that we pulled from resumes as they've come through. There's probably a million others that I can mention. Instrumental in ruining the operation. What was that supposed to say? And they probably thought cleverly, oh, I'm instrumental in running the operation. That's a strong bullet point. Traveled expensively through Europe. Probably meant extensively. Um, anyone wants to take me on an expensive trip of Europe, I'm happy to go. So again, be very careful about that. You may brush it off and laugh about it. I can promise you the recruiter that reads that will pin it on a board, highlight it, and laugh at you for months because you're not going to get a job. They're going to throw your, your application in the trash. A graduate school is going to take the same approach. They're not really going to think it's funny that you accidentally put the wrong thing on your resume. So be very careful and understand that spell check is not enough. You need to have human eyes on your resume. And don't just count on one person. Go to the writing lab. Go to one of your professors that you trust. Go to your mom or dad. And, and get someone to put their eyes on it and make sure that what you're saying makes sense. All right, so this is an example that I wanted to share with you of Joan Smith. And Joan is one of our graduates that, this is actually a student's resume. We've kind of changed it around a little bit. But you can see that the basic segments are broken down. You've got education, which is framed out experience and leadership and we're going to look a little bit closer at those because I know that is really far away. So the first part lists Wofford College and also details out some of her travel experiences. So this student had a lot of extensive travel, several semesters or several interims a semester and had done a lot and gained a lot of experience. So you'll want to look at that and then her awards are listed below. Finally, her experience and her skills. So it's interesting to note that she put Spanish, 
in Arab, so she, and it should actually be Arabic. That's my bad. So these are some representations of the way that you would frame out your experiences. And all of these samples are online, so if you want to look at samples more closely and begin to model your resume after it, they are online under resume writing. Next is her leadership and community service. So these are her activities. These are the things that she's involved in and she's highlighting those. And again, you can see that it's very specific about what she did. Directed all sorority meetings and rituals for 100 members. Served as a li liaison between student members and the college administration. So this is someone that had to interact with the upper echelon of Wofford's administration. Supported campus-wide discussion of Greek life and how it affects Wofford students. So again, showing that really taking leadership and getting, gaining experience. Served as a board member, promoted campus participation and activities benefiting Spartanburg community. So again, these could be better bullets. When you talk about serving and giving back, how exactly were you doing that? So again, be detailed. Here's another sample that I wanted to show you where the student had much more experience than the last example. And you'll notice that really two-thirds of this resume is experience. So they had several internships and jobs throughout their experience here at Wofford. And the activities and awards is a very small segment right at the bottom. So I see that. So that's different. Guys are slowing down on me. So this one shows you that she had also studied abroad. So if you only do a single semester abroad, that would still be something you would include under education. And then finally, her experiences. So she had some solid experience. She's actually working with Deloitte Consulting and was one of the first Wofford students to get a job with Deloitte upon graduation. And she brings them back. And I know it said Thomas, but this is a female. Um, she brings Deloitte back to campus every uh, fall so that we can hire more Wofford students. And she's brought on one other Wofford student as well. So she was one of the first, and she worked very hard, and they were very impressed with her resume. So she's a great sample. Cover letters. So we're going to quickly go through a basic format for a cover letter. Now, we talked about the different uses of a resume. What are the different uses? Well, I put them up there, so that's cheating. <laughs> Different uses of a cover letter include applying for a job. If you know there's a specific job and they say something like send a cover letter and resume. You would also use this if you're trying to get recommendations. So you would put the cover letter in the body of your email and send it to your professor or your supervisor. And it would basically outline what you're asking the recommendation for. And it's also used for networking. So I'm going to detail out the basic form of a cover letter up here on the whiteboard. And then we'll look at an email that's a networking email that's not going to have the exact same form as a cover letter. But this is a way that you can start to professionally write that will really impress the people that read your emails or read your cover letters. Before I do that, though, any questions about resumes? How many of you have written a resume already? How many of you have one that's a page? It's pretty good. OK, excellent, good. Well, I look forward to seeing all of your samples. All right, so. When writing a resume, a cover letter, do, should I do it on this one, Erin? Is it better? Okay. When writing a cover letter, you really want to form your thoughts and start and just put everything on the page and then go back and begin to edit it down from there. So format is not really important. I tell people, you know, don't worry about reading a book on how to format a cover letter. Basically, you want to get you know, their information at the top and then go through and kind of left justify everything and put spaces between your paragraphs. If you're submitting an application to an email address, your cover letter will always go in the body of your email because it's extremely awkward to try to write an email, attach a cover letter, and attach a resume. So simply paste it into the body of your email. They'll print that off with your resume if they need it. But normally, you just need to get the cover letter in the body of the email. So your first paragraph, the purpose of your first paragraph is to explain who you are 
and either what you're applying for or how you got their information. So how you know them. So if you're applying for a specific job, you would say something like, my name is Jennifer Dillinger and I'm applying for the financial analyst position you have posted on your website. Don't say something cute like, I'm interested in the opportunity you have available for a financial analyst position. You're interested in it, I'm a little bit confused, are you actually applying? Get straight to the point, I'm applying for this position. If you're sending a networking email or you're asking for a recommendation, it might more be along the lines of, my name is Jennifer Dillinger and I'm reaching out to you because Tom Jones, my friend at BB&T, recommended that I call you or that I email you. So again, you're telling them how you got their information so that they don't immediately just delete the email. So it's very important to kick this part off first. The second paragraph, is where you tell them about you. So it's a summary of you. So what are your experiences? What are your, what is your, your knowledge? So again, what major did you have? And then also maybe a little bit about your goals. So again, this is just basic information about you. I'm currently attending Wofford College where I'm a biology and English major and I'm interested in pursuing a career in healthcare management. My internship experiences include a summer spent at regional healthcare where I worked alongside the president and another semester long service spent at a nonprofit organization. So again, you're just giving them a little bit of information about you. Now it doesn't need to be word for word from your resume. This is something maybe they wouldn't read in your resume, but you're just pulling it all back together so that they can understand where you're coming from. I feel like this one's not very bright. Your third paragraph is where you connect you to them. So now you've reached out to them, you've expressed interest in this job or learning more about their company or networking with them. So how do all the things that you talked about over here, your experiences, your knowledge, the, the goals that you have, how does that connect to their job, company, or industry? So why exactly are you interested in networking with them? Since you, are, since you serve as the vice president at bb and Regional here in Spartanburg, I knew that you would have a, a wealth of knowledge on the hiring process at bb and Since my experiences and my goals have led me to apply for your leadership program, I wanted to find out if we could have a phone conversation. So again, why are you connected to them? If it's a job, why are you applying for this job? You know, the past four years at Wofford and my experiences have given me a unique set of skills that are a perfect fit for the financial analyst position you have posted. Your job description asks for the following traits and I have gained those through my service to the community, my experience with the James Fund, and my internships with Goldman Sachs. So all of a sudden you're taking everything that is you and you're saying this is why I'm a perfect candidate or this is all the things I've done and this is why I want to talk to you or network with you or meet you or hear about jobs from you. So again, why exactly are you connecting with them? Finally, in your conclusion paragraph, your fourth paragraph, you're going to thank them for their time a lot of people forget this, so make sure you thank them. I appreciate you taking a moment to read my resume, or to read my email. Attach your resume so that they can look at other things you may not have covered. And then the most important thing is a call to action. So what exactly are you hoping to get from this? Do you want them to let you know what the next step in the hiring process is? If it's a networking email, you need to be specific about what you're wanting from that person. 
I would appreciate it if you could review my resume and offer any suggestions that would make it a stronger example or a, make me a stronger candidate for a financial analyst position with your company. Or I would welcome the opportunity to spend a few minutes on the phone with you. Are you available in the next five to ten days? So if you don't have a call to action, if you don't have a specific thing that you're asking for, it makes it very easy or very difficult, but very easy for them to say no or very difficult for them to know how to help you. So that is an extremely important part. And you're also reiterating to that hiring manager, I want this job. So what is the next step? If it's a graduate school application, you're normally not going to have to do a cover letter. If you do, let me know and we can talk through what your call to action would be. So here is a sample letter. You can see that this is broken down into four, four paragraphs. Your cover letter should never be longer than three quarters to a full page. A full page is pushing it. Brevity is better. So you can see that this individual says, my name is and I'm applying for the business and compliance coordinator posted on your website. Goes into a little bit more detail. This first paragraph can be two to three sentences, period. So you don't want it to be very long, first paragraph. Second paragraph, in May 2009, I wrapped up my career as a baseball player at Wofford College. At Wofford, I majored in business economics and participated in many on-campus activities, including the James Fund. I immediately stepped into a new role as a volunteer baseball coach at Liberty, and I received a promotion after the first year. Again, this goes through this person's experiences. Finally, my experience in college athletics will be an asset to the USC Upstate Athletic Department. So again, that connection between what I've done and how I'm prepared to be a good fit for you. Finally, thank you for your time and consideration. I am very interested in this position and I have attached my resume. You can reach me at 864 or james.smith at gmail.com. I look forward to hearing from you. So again, very short, very to the point. You are telling them what you want. Now, I will be honest. Cover letters are much more successful as a networking tool than as a job tool. So you really want to use this to, to find out about opportunities that aren't just posted online, but that will allow you to get to the next level before there's even a job posting. It, it really depends. I mean, if it's a networking email, your, your subject might be um, seeking assistance from a Wofford alum. So you might say, or, or it might say biology major seeking assistance from a Wofford alum. And I was worried about like, you know, like if someone's email um, inbox is full, I don't want them to be like, oh, like what's that? And just like skip right over it. Just don't put anything about money in it. It was really funny. We sent out an email one time to students and we said $100 drawing or something like that was the subject. And it went into everyone's spam box. I mean, immediately, and it was coming from a Wofford address to another. So you want to be careful and not say, I would be careful with seeking, too. Um, honestly, a favor, a, you know, a, a quick favor from a Wofford student, for a Wofford student is a good thing if it's a networking email. If it's an application, you would put the job title you're applying for and your name, which is really helpful. And often with your professors, and this will be useful once you get into graduate school, if you're sending a professor an email, we don't have this problem at Wofford because your classes are, are normally no more than 25 or 30 people. But professors won't know what class you're in. So in, in my master's classes now, I always put the name of the class, so management 770, a colon, and my name with a question after it. And it just makes it extremely searchable for the professor. And you really want to think about that on campus here as well. If you're sending a recommend, you're asking for a recommendation, you should probably put your name, your class, and you know, asking for a recommendation or a recommendation for graduate school or a recommendation for job. So that when they suddenly remember they have to write that, they can go to their search box and type that in and your email pops right up. So always consider these small things as you write um, emails. Have one final email I want to show you. This is a networking email, and this is actually what not to do, and then I'm going to show you the one that what is what to do. 
So again, this one doesn't follow the exact format we discussed. It's a little bit different, but I want you to consider that when you're sending an email, it is important that you sit down and think about it very carefully before you hit send. Mr. Porter, coming into my senior year, I've started the search for a successful career path, hopefully starting around June 2013. I really appreciated your advice last year in my search for a summer internship and was hoping you would be able to provide me with the same guidance in my search this year. If you have any advice or know anyone that I could get in touch with to aid in my job search, I would be extremely grateful. Thank you very much for your time. I look forward to hearing from you. What are the issues with this email? Hopefully starting. It's kind of awkward that you're graduating in May and you're kind of going to give yourself a month's vacation. Don't do that. People that are out working don't normally appreciate it when people send them an email and are like, hey, I need your help, and I graduate in May, but I want to take a month off. So be careful about that. It's also extremely vague. I, I don't even know what this person is going into or really what specifically they need help with or what their background is. So again, this is very quick. I sat down, I jotted it out. Now granted, this individual did send it to someone and say, oh, is this an okay email to send? And it was rewritten and this is kind of the final email. I trust you're having an enjoyable summer. I'm spending the second half of mine at Wofford attending the Institute for Professional Development. And I should preface, these people do know each other. I wouldn't say well, but they would be on a recognizable first name basis. Although we're only one week into the five week program, I'm already learning quite a bit. One of our most enjoyable challenges is our consulting engagement. My team is working with OTO Development to create a solution that addresses pricing, marketing, and sales strategies for its geographically dispersed hotel operations. The engagement requires advanced Excel skills so I get to build on my solid background as well as assist others in my group with a little less Excel experience. I really appreciated your advice last year in my search for a summer internship and was hoping you would be able to provide me with similar guidance in my search this year. I'm eager to create options as I approach my senior year. My goal, my goal is to have an opportunity secured prior to graduating in May 2013. If you have 10 minutes just to talk about my search, I would greatly appreciate it. I know you are extremely busy, so if you are able to let me know when your schedule might accommodate a conversation, I will most certainly adhere to 10 minutes. Thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to hearing from you. So again, this is saying all I need is 10 minutes. These are some things I'm doing right now. These are some experiences I've had. And, and just a reminder of who they are and very, very specifically asking for something that this person can deliver on. A 10 minute conversation isn't a lot. Any questions? We have gone 45 minutes, so I don't wanna run any longer. This is an art, it really is. It's an art that you need to work on and think about and ask for help. That's why we're here. Anytime you've got an email that you wanna send, anytime you're submitting a cover letter, we're available for that. So I hope that you will use those resources and make sure that as you seek help, you're doing it in the most formal, appropriate, and respectful way possible. 